Right, so moving on to the, the substance of uh, this afternoon's session and, and how we use the law to challenge cuts to short break services. Uh, this is the agenda. And before uh, we go on to that agenda, I'd like to make sure that everyone's got a copy of the uh, Every Disabled Child Matters campaign uh, briefing, Challenging Cuts to Short Break Services, that I produced with Alex Rooker, Owen Mitchell Solicitors, and the campaign, and which was published this week very helpfully. Uh, we will occasionally go um, to various web resources during this session, and I'll do it now. You should now see, hopefully, browser coming up. And to show you how you find that resource, if you haven't got it, if you type in EDCM short breaks resource, after you get various uh, city break offers, you can see the uh, link to the EDCM website and you can download the legal resource here on the right hand side and the document is available here. So that's what it should look like. Hopefully people have uh, already had a chance to have a quick look. Don't worry if you haven't because I'm essentially going to talk to it today at a slide to summarize it and you can go back and look at the detail uh, after we finished. So what's covered in the resource and what am I covering today? Firstly, the context. Why are we here talking about short breaks? What has happened with short breaks since aiming high for disabled children? Many of you will know this much better than me, but just to make sure we're all on the same page about why short breaks matter and, and what uh, was intended by the investment in them that flowed from the aiming high for disabled children program. Then moving on to the first legal issue, which is the short breaks duty, um, which was part of the package of reforms that uh, we obtained through aiming high for disabled children and which led particularly to the breaks for carers of disabled children regulations in 2011, which are probably the most important bit of law um, if we're looking to challenge cuts to short break services. But they're not the only bit of law. Um, there is a, a wide range of relevant legal duties, which we summarize in the paper. And we'll look at as many of those as time allows this afternoon as well. And then we'll take a short break um, after about an hour, by which time I'm sure everyone will need uh, a, a cup of tea uh, at least uh, to keep going. And once we've had our break, we'll move on to um, how you can use the law to challenge cuts and, and particularly focus on issues around consultation and the public sector equality duty. And also then the really pressing issue of, of what practically do we do, uh, particularly as forums to um, challenge proposed cuts and indeed actual cuts once they've been made. And I'll talk there both about um, legal challenges but also primarily about campaigning in, in the broadest sense. How can forums lobby and influence uh, local authorities and the NHS not to make cuts? It's obviously going to be better if we can stop cuts being made in the first place than if we have to try and challenge them uh, using the courts as, as a rearguard action. So uh, the focus today is very much on using the law in our campaigning and our lobbying and our influencing work locally to try and uh, protect services at this very difficult time. So with those uh, words of introduction, oh, and just to say, because as you'll see there is a, a menu for today, where I've got questions that address issues that are going to come up later, I'll answer them at the relevant time. So if you've asked questions in advance, I do intend to answer them, but maybe not just yet, so do please um, uh, allow me to, to get to the relevant point before I deal with the concerns that are raised. Also on questions, I won't be able to deal with specific proposals from particular local authorities. So if you can, please ask your questions in a general way. Um, if you ask a specific question, I'll probably give you a general answer. So uh, that's, uh, that's the way it's going to have to be. The context. I don't intend to uh, spend much time telling this audience uh, why short breaks matter. Um, the parliamentary hearings for services for disabled children were a very important marker, I think, in 2006 that um, the state of services for disabled children was, was woefully inadequate and the primary need was for regular, reliable and sustainable short breaks. And, and we have, of course, the very important evidence from uh, MENCAP on that point. And it is worth, I think, just highlighting that there's an excellent resource online from MENCAP. If you Google MENCAP breaking point, they put together uh, a web page with the work that they did on the Breaking Point campaign between, as it says, 2003 and 2014. And what that gives us is the link to the three Breaking Point reports. And perhaps most relevantly, now we've got the third and final report in 2013, 
which is the web page says, uh, 10 years on from their first survey, 8 out of 10 family carers were still reaching breaking point. And very concerningly, 4 out of 10 families had had their short break services cut by that point. And we're, of course, much further on into this era of austerity and cuts. Um, now we, we're looking at local authorities setting their budgets for 2015-16. So that's the, that's the very concerning context and the, the level of need. What are short breaks? Well, they are, as it says on the slide, um, day, evening, overnight, and weekend activities for the child or young person. And that is a very important point, that short break services are services for children with the intention of providing their parents, carers, with a break. So the service has to work for all members of the family. And it has to work for the child, primarily, and children's interests and needs being uh, prime. But it also has to work for the, for the other siblings and for the parents. Uh, and that's what we're looking for, a, a holistic approach to short break provision. And they can take place anywhere. A short break could be in the child's home, in a, a approved carer's home, or a residential or a community setting. So there's, there's intended to be a very flexible menu of breaks and uh, no one-size-fits-all approach. However, what is clear, uh, and it's dealt with um, in some detail in, in the background section of the of the paper from EDCM, what are short breaks and why do they matter, and the investment section that follows, um, is that we needed to move away from a crisis model. Where short breaks were being provided prior to aiming high for disabled children, it was very often high cost residential um, crisis breaks. And what families were saying they wanted, and, and as I understand it still want, is regular reliable patterns of breaks that, that prevent crises from, from taking place. And that was the real focus of the Aiming High for Disabled Children program, um, which led on from the parliamentary hearings for services, of services for disabled children. I haven't actually checked, but I'm assuming the parliamentary hearings report is still online. Let's have a little look. Because I would suggest if you're dealing with um, local authorities and CCGs, who are thinking about cutting breaks, that one of the key things to make sure is that they understand the context, that they see where this level, these level of breaks come from. Here it is great on the EDCM website. And, and really, the context can't, I don't think, can be any better set than in this report from 2006. And so when councillors might be saying, well, why are we spending so much money on short breaks? This seems to be much higher than other areas of service for, for children or generally. This is the answer. It's because, firstly, there was woeful underinvestment previously, and short breaks really matter, and the evidence is summarized in, in this report. So that might be a useful document to, to keep close to hand. What did Amy High for Disabled Children do? Well, that's summarized in the EDCM paper. Essentially, it involved a huge investment in services, and um, by both local authorities and the NHS. The initial um, revenue allocation for local authorities from 2008 to 2011 was 340 million pounds, intended to, uh, amongst other things, uh, include 40,000 additional fortnightly short breaks, notionally, um, so that, that level of provision be, uh, being made available. Then an extra 90 million in 2008 in capital funding, and then the Department of Health essentially match funded that through the 2009 Child Health Strategy. Um, and for the period 2008-2011, increased the level of funding available to what were then primary care trusts, of course, um, particularly for short breaks and other services. So when you total it all up, it comes to close to a billion pounds of, of additional investment in um, disabled children's services, the lion's share of which was, was either expressly allocated to short breaks, ring-fenced, or intended to improve short break services. And um, the evidence from EDCM and the government's own research was that this made a huge difference, unsurprisingly. Although the benefits were unevenly spread across the country, um, there were benefits in, in almost every area. And the most important benefit was the move away from this crisis model to a preventative model and the development of self-referral models, the second point on the slide, um, that breaks should be available through a local offer with no formal assessment required. One local authority I'm aware of has a, a gateway system where you access a card by showing a, a very low level of, of evidence of uh, disability for the child, and then you can bid to providers who've been given funding and have a certain amount of short breaks to 
um, provide and families can access those when the, when the money's run out, the breaks stop. That's absolutely great and um, it's good practice to have that local offer type model um, of, of relatively low level breaks. What's essential from a, a legal point of view is that that doesn't replace the entitlement to an assessment and a level of service that's sufficient to meet eligible needs. Come on to that in a moment. So what I would say the law certainly um, indicates, if not requires, is that you'd have a broad base of, of non-assessed short breaks available to most disabled children and families. An entitlement to a formal assessment under the Children Act 1989 for any child and family who, who want one, and then decisions to be made about additional um, packages of support to meet assessed needs for those children who meet eligibility criteria. Come on to those in a moment. So you'd have a, a pyramid model with a broad base and then a narrower um, triangle of children and families accessing a much higher level of breaks potentially for those children and families with the most complex needs or more complex needs, not necessarily the most complex. So that was the model that um, the funding from Aiming High for Disabled Children, AHDC, was intended to create. What the EDCM paper does, if you jump forward, if those are following it, another page, there's a heading funding for short breaks after aiming high for disabled children. And I have to say, I find this extremely complicated to follow. But the essence of, of what I understand follows in the, in the next four paragraphs is that although the funding was no longer ring-fenced, it was actually sustained and arguably slightly increased. And you see this in the, the paragraph that starts with Elizabeth Truss, MP. She said in uh, answer to a parliamentary question at the beginning of last year that funding for early intervention through various grants to local authorities had actually increased from 2.2 billion in 2011-12 to 2.5 billion in 2014-15. Um, now we don't have the figures for the coming financial year, what, what the position is for 2015-16. And of course local authorities were undoubtedly under pressure in other areas. But it does show that government was expressly intending um, funding to be sustained for short breaks, at the very least until the current financial year, the one that we're that's just coming towards an end now. And so that is important evidence, I'd suggest, for you to put back, to push back with, when officers <clears throat> and councillors are saying, we haven't got any money, because they have. They may not have any money in other areas, but the intention from government, was central government, was that local authorities should sustain the current level of short break provision. But we know that that isn't what's happening and just from the sample of questions I've had already and from what I know from social media and other contacts, um, children's services generally and disabled children's services in particular are now being targeted for cuts. In, sorry, that's the slide should say 2015-16. And in many areas, uh, local forums, local groups, families will be told, we have no choice. There is no alternative. Well, it's very interesting, isn't it, to think about what's happened in Hampshire in that context because Hampshire were initially proposing to reduce their short breaks funding in 2015-16 by 1.85 million. So reducing the budget from 3 million to just over 1 million. And through the concerted efforts of um, Hampshire Parent Carer Voice and through a legal challenge uh, which I was involved with, the local authority has changed its mind to their credit and uh, no cuts are now proposed for uh, short breaks at least until um, April 2016, so the following financial year, and of course um, they will no doubt set their budget at that time based on further conversations with, with the families and the forum. So there was an alternative in Hampshire, and I'd suggest there is an alternative in, in most if not all local authorities. Obviously many local authorities um, are facing worse cuts than those in the south. We've seen um, the evidence that shows that the cuts are being unevenly distributed and um, some may genuinely have no choice. But it's very important not to take those assertions at, uh, at face value, I'd say, and to make sure that, that the right questions are asked. And, and two of the questions, we'll see in a bit more detail later on what, what kind of questions we should be asking. Two of the questions I'd suggest we, we ask are, uh, firstly, what's your reserves position, local authority? And in particular, um, what are your non-allocated reserves? How much money have you got essentially in the bank available for a rainy day? Because this is a rainy day. You know, this, is, this is the threat to vital support services for vulnerable families. And I don't see why local authorities um, should be holding reserves above those which are held to be necessary 
um, and statutorily necessary, uh, when at the same time proposing to cut these, these frontline services. Sure, make the efficiency savings, do things more, more efficiently if you can, but if actually what's being proposed are genuine cuts to frontline services, uh, why should that be done when, there, when there's money in the bank? So that's the first question, what, what reserves are available? The other very interesting question, I think, is, is what is the local authority doing in relation to its council tax? Um, people may be aware, anyone who follows local government, uh, anything like as geeky as I do, will be aware, that if a local authority wants to increase its council tax by 2% or more, it has to hold a referendum. And, of course, holding a referendum locally is going to cost money. So I understand why local authorities would be uh, reluctant to suggest propo uh, proposals for council tax increases above 2% or above 1.99% technically. But what about the local authorities that are still freezing council tax? So they're not increasing council tax at all. Is it right that services for vulnerable groups should be cut when council taxpayers are not being asked to uh, pay any more than they are at present? None of this is, is straightforward. Council tax is only a small percentage of local authority funding. Most of the funding comes from central government. That's where the squeeze is. But even if there are cuts that have to be made, do they have to be at the scale that's being proposed in some areas? And again, the Hampshire example would suggest not. So reserves and council tax are the two areas where I would suggest um, probing questions are asked, uh, both at council meetings and in conversations with uh, councillors and officers. So that's really the context um, and, and the funding arrangements that have been in place. And then, of course, the law sits on top of that. One of the interesting issues in this area is the relationship between funding and the law, because some legal duties have to be complied with regardless of cost and regardless of the availability of financial resources. In some ways, the um, key duty to provide social care, the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act duty, works like that. We'll see that it, it's complicated. There is a costs issue in relation to the CSDPA, as it's known. But um, there, once you've established that there is an eligible need, it has to be met regardless of cost. Other duties are expressly qualified in terms of reasonable practicability, cost, and so on. We'll see some of those in a moment as well. But the law doesn't say a local authority shall spend X million pounds or Y percentage of its budget on services for disabled children. And of course, a local authority's budget is just an estimate of how much it intends to spend, like any budget any of us might set. And it can spend less, and it can spend more. And if it spends more, then it will have to find money from other areas or from its reserves. So there's nothing magic about a local authority's budget. Those figures are not set in stone. And if uh, the law requires services to be provided, uh, it may be the case that saying we've run out of money is not a good defense for the local authority. And this is really important because there is a fear, I think, that once the budgets are set, there's nothing we can do. And that's, that's simply not right because there is always flexibility, no matter what um, councillors and officers may say. Hopefully they'll be upfront about that uh, because it's, it's a very straightforward point. So, um, as always with local campaigning, um, it's a long game. The first objective is going to be to try and stop budgets being cut. Even if they are cut, then it, the question becomes how are they going to be cut, which uh, elements of service are going to be reduced, and is the local authority still going to be in a position to comply with its legal duties? Those are the questions to keep asking. So, that's all the background. Moving on to the law and the second um, issue that we're going to cover today um, is the short breaks duty. And the duty that was introduced by Aiming High for Disabled Children uh, is intended to sustain the progress that was made um, through the, the funding investment. We've got the, the background and the wording in the EDCM paper, those of you who are following uh, the paper. And, and technically what happened, so everyone's got the context, is that in legislation introduced in 2008, the Children and Young Persons Act from that year, a new paragraph was inserted into, wait for it, Schedule 2 of the Children Act 1989. So we now have paragraph 61C of Schedule 2 to the Children Act 1989. Not the most accessible or straightforward system, 
but still a, a clear legal duty. And you can see if you're following the paper that the paragraph now reads, every local authority shall provide services, so it's clearly a duty on all local authorities, designed to, and there are three twos, um, just in passing, the first two are interesting, minimize the effect on disabled children within their area of their disabilities and give such children the opportunity to lead lives which are as normal as possible. I don't think either of those word, bits of wording would be used in 2015 if we were starting again. Uh, and certainly the first one is extremely medical model in its approach, uh, but potentially both useful um, in terms of reminding local authorities what the point is of the services that they're supposed to provide. And then the paragraph that was added is C, to assist individuals who provide care for such children, disabled children, to continue to do so, or, and the important bit here, to do so more effectively by giving them breaks from caring. And that's really um, what we're on today, to do so more effectively by giving them breaks from caring. Again, slightly cu curious wording, but what I suggest Parliament's getting at is sustainability, positive outcomes, ordinary lives for families, uh, so not just a crisis service. That paragraph uh, is the baseline, but what then matters um, even more fundamentally uh, are the regulations that are made under it, the Breaks for Carers of Disabled Children Regulations 2011. And we'll have a little look at those and where we find those. Now, I don't think these regulations have been amended since they were enacted. So if you Google, as I'm doing, their name, you should get up the current version. As always, be looking out here for the legislation.gov.uk website. That's the official government site. And the easiest way to, to look at them is going to be if we open the original PDF. So you can see, first of all, they came into force on the 1st of April 2011. So they've been in force for a significant time now. The Secretary of State makes the following regulations in exercise of the powers under this paragraph 6.2 of, of Schedule 2 to the Children Act. So you can see the regulations are directly linked to the new duty in paragraph 6 that we were just looking at. And a few points of interpretation that are important. When the regulation talks about carers, it means a person who provides care for a disabled child and is the parent or a person who has parental responsibility. So parent carers insured. And disabled means the same as it does under the Children Act 1989. And we have very small, the definition, which is again horribly medical, um, but very broad. So if the child is deaf, dumb, uh, deaf, sorry, blind, deaf or dumb, or suffers from mental disorder of any kind, that's the key phrase, or is substantially and permanently handicapped by illness, injury, or congenital deformity, or such other disability as may be prescribed. So it's very broad, uh, and we shouldn't be arguing, often if at all, about whether or not children are disabled. It's, uh, it's, that's not um, uh, generally a live issue. There are three substantive regulations in terms of uh, duties on local authorities. And the first is Regulation 3, which says that in performing their new duty, the short breaks duty in paragraph 61C, a local authority must, so this is, these are more duties, it's mandatory language, have regard to the needs of those carers who would be unable to continue to provide care unless break for caring were given to them. So those are families in crisis, very important, but not really moving things on from the previous law. And the new bit, have regard to the needs of those carers who would be able to provide care for their disabled children more effectively if breaks for caring were given to them to allow them to, one, undertake education, training, or regulation activities, two, meet the needs of other children in the family more effectively, or three, carry out day-to-day -day tasks in order to run their household. Again, I would say ordinary lives. So the purpose of providing short breaks is to allow families with disabled children to lead ordinary lives. And what's missing from that list, a number of things, but an obvious thing that's missing is work employment. And the reason for that is that the law distinguishes between short breaks and childcare. The intention of childcare is to allow families to work. And there are very important legal duties in relation to childcare, which I deal with um, on the blog. So if you're interested in that and haven't seen already, if you Google rights and reality childcare, you'll get up the, the post that sets out those duties. But it's an important um, point of principle that uh, short breaks are not intended to be provided 
provided to support families to work. That doesn't mean they can't be provided to support families to work. But if a service is being provided to support families to work, that is technically, as a matter of law, childcare. So that's the purpose. That's what local authorities have, have to have regard to. Now, when a, when a local authority or a public body has a have regard duty, that means they've got to think about the issue. It doesn't mean they've got to achieve the outcome, but they've got to think about the issue. So the issue, so the evidence that they would need to show is that in decision making about the level and, and type of short breaks, these factors are taken into account. And if they weren't, that's unlawful and can be challenged uh, by way of judicial review. And that's exactly what's happened in all the case law on the public sector equality duty, which is also, in that case, a due regard duty. Um, so we've got a very important precedent to show that these types of issues can be challenged. So that's regulation three. Regulation four then fleshes out the duty even further in terms of the types of services. So, and this is the sufficiency duty. A local authority must provide, so far as is reasonably practicable, a range of services which is sufficient to assist carers to continue to provide care or do so more effectively. And in particular, daytime care in the home, overnight care in the home, or elsewhere in both cases, educational leisure activities outside the home for children and uh, support services in the evenings and the weekends and during school holidays all have to be available. Must provide, you can see in Regulation 4 too. So any cuts to short break services which prevent the local authority from providing all of these types of services will be unlawful. It doesn't mean that every family has to be able to access each of these types of services, far from it what the local authority have to do is make sure that these services are available so far as reasonably practical at a sufficient level to assist the carers to continue to provide care or do so more effectively. So of course they can take into account how much money they have, but the aim must be to provide a sufficient level of service. And what does that require? I think it requires three things. First of all, the local authority has got to understand the need. It's got to understand what level of need families with disabled children in their area have. So it's got to know how many families there are. Does your local authority maintain a disabled children's register as required by paragraph 2 of the schedule to a 1989 Act? Most don't, as I understand it. So how else are they going to be able to show that they know how many families with disabled children may need short breaks? That's the first element. The second element is what's the level of services? Do they really understand? how many short breaks, what types, who's providing them, uh, are available in the local area. And if they answer both, then answer both of those questions, then the third question is, does the level of service available roughly meet the need? That's what sufficiency means. And in order to, again, demonstrate uh, compliance with the regulations, um, which are law, of course, and um, not guidance, but law, the local authority has to have gone through that process, and, and if they haven't, then they're not acting in accordance with their duties, and again, judicial review would be the, the legal remedy. And then we move on to Regulation 5, which is the, the transparency element of this, really, the short break services statement. So every local authority must uh, prepare a statement for carers in their area, a short break services statement, um, interestingly not aimed at children, but just at parents, which uh, we may want to take the department up uh, on at some point setting out details of the range of services, any eligibility criteria, very importantly, and how the services are designed to meet the needs of carers, so essentially uh, explaining the sufficiency duty compliance. So the short break statement has to say what's available, A, what criteria you might have to meet to access it, and um, how the local authority is, is, is reasonably considering that that's sufficient. So that there is a duty to publish eligibility criteria now. Very importantly, there should be no secret eligibility criteria for short breaks. And there might, of course, be two different types of criteria. There might be a criterion around um, the non-assessed breaks, what's the minimum that you have to show in order to um, access a very basic level of breaks. And then the, the, the criteria in relation to um, a higher level of breaks should always be rooted in assessment, of course. So it would be unlawful to have eligibility criteria that are not based on the outcome of a full assessment under the Children Act 1989. So those are the duties. Oh, just to complete this, the short break services statement, um, they've got to publish it, including by placing a copy of the statement on the website. Now the code of practice, paragraph 4.44 um, from memory, says that that has to now be alongside the local offer, which is very helpful. So the short break
service statement must be with the other materials on the local offer website required under the Children and Families Act. Uh, and therefore, then the, the statement has to be kept under review and revised where appropriate, having regard to the views of, of uh, parent carers. So if the statement hasn't been updated since April 2011, I would strongly suggest that the, the forum should be asking for it to be reviewed and um, the views of families taken into account. So that is a very brief run through of the um, short breaks services statement and the other duties within the breaks for carers of disabled children regulations. I'm just going to reduce the slides slightly because I'm concerned people can't see the full thing. I'm sure I'll be very quickly told if this is an unhelpful thing to do. Oh, hang on, I need to be here. That's better. Hopefully you can now see the headings uh, if you couldn't before. So this, uh, these two slides really just summarise and reinforce what I've said by going uh, directly to the regulations. You've got the key uh, requirements of regulations 3, 4 and 5 there. What the short break services statement must cover. But what's really important I suggest is, is not to treat the uh, short breaks duty in a vacuum. It's intended to build upon the existing and indeed the later legal obligations. So make sure the local authority is fully aware of their, their duties under the 2011 regulations, but also make sure they're thinking about at least the following four areas, which I would say are the other key legal duties. And again, for people who are following the paper, you've got this after the section on cuts and short break services in 2015-16, You've then got a heading legal issues and we set out the, uh, these duties in more detail there and provide various references. <laughs> so firstly, uh, the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act 1970 Section 2, CSDPA is the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act 1970 and anyone who's ever heard me talk pretty much about anything will know uh, how important I think this duty is and how under-recognized it is. Why is the CSDPA so important? It's so important because the Children Act 1989 does not create a right to services for disabled children and their families. The Children Act 1989, Section 17, is a general duty owed to all children in need. So there must be services for children in need, including disabled children, um, designed to help them achieve and maintain a reasonable level of health and development and to um, maintain their family uh, units, but they're not each individual child in need um, is not entitled to a service by reason of Section 17 of the 1989 Act. So the entitlement, the right, comes from Section 2. It's, it is the key duty to provide all types of social care to disabled children. Now, um, it's horribly complicated and we don't need to get into the detail uh, of it today, but uh, there is a very detailed explanation on, on the blog if you Google Rights in Reality CSDPA, those who haven't seen it. The key thing to note at the outset is that uh, all types of short breaks apart from residential breaks can be provided under the CSDPA. Um, so short breaks at home are provided under paragraph 21A and short breaks in the community are provided under paragraph 21C. So uh, we know this from the JL and Islington case. So the only type of short break that can't be provided um, under the CSDPA is, is residential breaks, um, which are provided either under the general duty in the Children Act, Section 17, or where families are in crisis under Section 20 of the Children Act. How does the CSDPA work? Essentially, the question is, um, is it necessary to meet the child's needs? So where it is necessary to meet the child's needs, then a service must be provided. But um, because of the Barry judgment, which I'm hoping we've got footnote two in the paper, we have indeed. So footnote two in this section, uh, as decided by the House of Lords, by the narrowest majority, 3-2, in the Barry case back in 1996, I think it was decided, reported in 1997. Um, local authorities are entitled to take account of their resources when they're deciding whether it's necessary to meet needs. So necessity is relative. Uh, something which is necessary today might no longer be necessary. It might only be desirable tomorrow if 
suddenly the local authority's got less money. And that's why um, for a long time in adult care, we've had the bands of eligibility, critical, substantial, moderate, and low that have flowed from the Fair Access to Care Services guidance. Because a local authority might say one year, well, we're relatively well off this year, so we accept it's necessary to meet moderate and substantial and critical needs. But the following year, it might say, well, times are tougher, so we're going to raise the threshold, and we only accept it's necessary to meet uh, critical and substantial needs. And that is a lawful approach to take under the CSDPA. That's the bad news. The good news is that once it's accepted that it is necessary to provide a service, then the local authority has to provide it. That's the legal duty, regardless of the cost. The only way in which cost uh, can be taken into account at this stage is that the local authority um, only has to fund uh, the, the most cost-effective way of meeting the need. So as long as the need is met, if there are two uh, options and one costs more than the other, the local authority is entitled to choose the cheaper. But other than that, um, cost is irrelevant. And so JL and Islington shows that um, you can't have a cap on services. You can't say, okay, for those children who we accept are eligible, the maximum amount of short breaks are 100 hours a year. The maximum amount of short breaks must be whatever the local authority judges to be necessary to meet the particular child's needs. And how do they make that judgment? They make it by carrying out an assessment under Section 17 of the Children Act. So there's the link to the Children Act duties. The Children Act duty create, it is the duty to assess, um, and then the um, CSDPA duty is the duty to provide. And assessments under the Children Act have to be conducted in accordance with the Working Together to Safeguard Children Statutory Guidance. That's the new guidance issued in 2013. Um, the Framework for the Assessment of Children in Need which created uh, differences between initial assessments and core assessments. That's now uh, been, been sidelined, I think it's fair to say. It's been rendered um, practice guidance rather than statutory guidance. So the, uh, the real um, guidance that matters is working together 2013. Um, we haven't got time to go into the detail of that today, but one very important point of principle from working together is that children in need should, be, uh, should have a social work assessment, uh, paragraph 17, sorry, page 17 of the guidance makes that clear. And that matters because in many areas, I know, uh, access to assessment is being restricted. It's already restricted or is, or is being restricted. So only those families or children and families with what are deemed to be complex needs can access an assessment, a proper assessment by a social worker, and other children are only able to get a CAF, a common assessment framework, or another type of early help assessment. And in my view, at least, um, that's not consistent with what Working Together to Safeguard Children says. And all, children, all disabled children are children in need, and all children in need who request one are entitled to an assessment. So that's the, the role of the CSDPA. It's very much an individualized duty. And, and really, it's the baseline, because once whatever budget is set, the local authority will have to accept that some children will have needs that it's necessary for them to meet. They must have fair and rational eligibility criteria, which involve some children um, getting a service. And, and in my view, it has to be at least that those children who, as adults, would have critical needs are entitled to a short break as children. Because we can't have a situation where disabled children have a lesser entitlement to services than adults. And from 1st of April, of course, the national eligibility criteria for adults come in under the CARE Act. And they're supposed to be roughly set at the level of substantial now. I don't necessarily accept that. And if you, if you want to know more about that, have a look at my, my blog post about eligibility criteria under the CARE Act. But certainly the government's intention is that all disabled adults with what would now be critical or substantial needs would have their needs met. And my view is that that has to be the same for children. Otherwise, it would be a breach of Article 14 of the European Convention on Human Rights because children being treated less favorably than adults without any good reason. Uh, it would be discrimination, in short. So that's the CSDPA. We then got um, a very different type of duty, the duty introduced by Section 27 of the Children and Families Act 2014. And this does something rather similar, I think, to Regulation 4 of the Short Breaks Regulations. Uh, Section 27 of the Children and Families Act tells local authorities they've got to consider generally the extent to which uh, education and social 
and care provision, for our purposes, social care provision, is sufficient to meet the needs in the area. And again, I say that requires the local authority to have uh, the relevant information in three areas. How many disabled children have they got? And, and also, what level of need do those children have, broadly? Um, what services are available? And the $64,000 question, is the level of service meeting need? Now, if funding is significantly cut, it may be that the local authority can't demonstrate that it's complied with the duty if it's cut without going through that thought process. So that's part of the question uh, that I suggest we ask and get answers to. Next, we move on to the uh, very interesting questions around human rights. Is there a human right to short breaks for disabled children and their families? And I'm going to give the classic lawyer's answer, which is, it depends on all the circumstances. It's undoubtedly the case that short breaks are a way in which the state demonstrates uh, its respect for family and private life, which is required under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, family life is pretty obvious. It's the lives of our families, and support may be required to enable family life to continue. You know that from a case called Anna Fujeva. Uh, but then private life is very interesting. Private life is, is about much more than just privacy. For example, it's about your physical and psychological integrity. You know that from a, a, what Lord Bingham said in a, an immigration case called Rasgar. And so if the short breaks are essential for the child and perhaps the parents' physical well-being, and psychological and mental well-being, then um, it, they may be required by virtue of, of Article 8 uh, in terms of the right to respect for private life. Um, article 8 is often read with Article 14, which is the prohibition on, on discrimination. So again, if, if um, other children can access the community without additional support, but disabled children can't, is there a breach of Article 14? Um, equally, if a higher level of service is available for older people or disabled adults than for children, is that discrimination under Article 14? Those are all the questions that would be, we would need to ask and answer. And then we've got the impact of the wider international conventions. And, and the three that are particularly relevant, sorry, the two that are particularly relevant are the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the CRC. Now, the, the traditional way of thinking is, well, these are just international instruments. They're, they have international law obligations. There's no way of enforcing any rights in them um, in the domestic courts. They don't create any kind of enforceable rights. But increasingly the courts are looking to the CRPD and to the CRC. And they're doing it really in two ways. Firstly, they're looking at the way in which those rights should influence the interpretation of the European Convention. So the European Convention is part of our law because of the Human Rights Act 1998. That's what we need to protect. Um, and that's what is under threat from the proposals that the Conservatives are putting forward. But for now, of course, the Human Rights Act remains very much part of our law. And so public bodies are obliged, as a matter of our law, domestic law, to, to, to comply with the ECHR rights, including Article 8. And the courts are saying, um, well, when we're deciding what is required under Article 8, for example, we will look to the other international conventions. So in the case of Burnett, which was a case about housing for disabled people, the court looked at Article 19, um, which is the requirement uh, in relation to independent living and community living to understand what was required um, domestically in that case. And Article 19 talks about there being a range of community support for disabled people, which includes children as well as adults. So in a sense, Article 19 reinforces the sufficiency duties that we've already described. And that is the second way that these conventions have, have force, because um, if there are two possible interpretations of domestic law, um, that the courts will always look to choose one that is compliant with the international conventions. So there's two indirect routes to get these uh, conventions in as a matter of law, but as a matter of politics with a small p, these are uh, treaties which bind the state and um, you should be arguing that they should be followed. So anything you can find in the CRPD or the CRC um, to point to, to reinforce your arguments, I would strongly urge uh, you to do that as forums. And in terms of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 23 is the article about disabled children, and it emphasizes their requirement for special care. But Article 3 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child has been incredibly important. It's the duty to treat children's best interests as a primary 
consideration in all decisions that affect them, and it's becoming increasingly clear that doesn't just mean individual case decisions. It means decisions like how much money are we going to have available for services for disabled children in our area. That's precisely the kind of duty that, um, or question, sorry, that Article 3 uh, is relevant to. And so that requires the public body to have done an assessment, again, of what children's best interests point towards. Best interest means essentially their well-being. Here it would be maintaining levels of short breaks, if not increasing them. And then treating those interests as a primary consideration and asking, does everything else outweigh them? So, for example, are the pressures on our budget really so great that we're going to have to reduce the funding even though um, it's not in the interest of disabled children? And if the, local, if the public body hasn't gone through that thought process and can't show that it's considered those issues, it may well be the court would interfere in, um, if it's challenged later on. So that again, at this stage and for forums, those are the sorts of questions you should be, we suggest you should be asking and, and requiring the local authority to answer. And then finally, on the um, relevant law, the Equality Act is really important as well. Um, David Wolfe QC spoke at the um, Special Education Consortium Council for Disabled Children seminar um, earlier this week uh, about human rights and disabled children. And he made the very important point that um, the Equality Act is one of the ways in which Parliament has, has, has intended disabled people's human rights to be respected. So the Equality Act is a human rights act. It's about the human right not to be discriminated against. And I'd say there are three key duties in the Equality Act. The first is the reasonable adjustments duty, which hopefully is now becoming familiar and becoming understood because it's been there since the Disability Discrimination Act was in force. And um, the duty is to make reasonable adjustments, including to policies, procedures, and practices. And that's the area which I would say is probably has its greatest thought, force, sorry, um, changing the way in which things are done. And that might be particularly important in relation to universal services that would provide short breaks to disabled children if they were accessible. And if they aren't accessible, then either the, the local authority or the body running the service may well have to make adjustments to make them more accessible. And uh, when working out whether something's a reasonable adjustment, cost is relevant. So if it's very expensive, it might not be reasonable to do it. But if it is reasonable to do it and you have got the money, um, then you can't charge for it. Very important point that you can't say, okay, well, we will employ another worker or um, change the hours or whatever it might be, change our policies and practices in some way, but you have to pay more. That would be a breach of the Act. So the reasonable adjustments duty is something we need to keep very much in the forefront of our minds in terms of changing the way in which things are done. Then you've got more classic disability discrimination, discrimination arising from disability which is where disabled um, children or adults are treated less well um, by a, because of something related to their disability, um, being excluded from services, being asked to leave because their behavior is seen to be uh, disrupting others' enjoyment of a particular event. Those kinds of um, less favorable treatments can be challenged under the Act. But in terms of the, the cuts and in terms of provision of services more generally, the most powerful duty has clearly been the public sector equality duty under section 149, uh, which is a duty to have due regard to a series of specified needs. And the need that I always think is the most important is the need to advance the quality of opportunity for disabled children compared to other children. Because again, that really gets to the heart of short breaks in terms of ordinary lives. So we want to make sure that um, disabled children are increasingly more able to lead the kinds of lives that other children lead and not disadvantaged compared to other children. So again, it's not a duty to achieve an outcome. The duty is not on the local authority to advance the quality of opportunity for disabled children. It's to think carefully about whether what they're proposing to do is consistent with that need, and if it isn't, whether there's an alternative that would be better, less detrimental to disabled children. It's another process duty. But there have been very many cases where local authorities and other bodies have been shown uh, that they haven't complied with that duty. And if you go over the page, if you're following in the paper, uh, where we've put question two, has the local authority complied with the public sector equality duty, we do one of those cases, uh, bracking, which I'll come back to this uh, after we've had our break to, um, uh, to think about how we challenge cuts. So that is um, the initial run-through 
of the, uh, the basic background law and the duties. I'm just going to take a look at the questions that I've been asked uh, in advance and see which of them um, deal with questions that, that uh, perhaps need to have been covered in the introduction. Um, so one of the questions I was asked is um, what's the legal position on direct payments being pushed as the only solution to achieving a short break? Is the pressure to accept all these out discriminatory? That's from Andrea. Um, yes, it is discriminatory. No, it's not lawful. Uh, and I'll deal with that by reference to the blog post. Um, I think this is still the most viewed post on my blog because I know that in many areas direct payments are a real thorny issue. And I've tried to answer some of the commonly asked questions or some of the common legal mistakes that get made. And one of them is precisely this point about whether uh, families can be forced to take a direct payment. And the short answer is no, they can't. Direct payments are a choice, they're an option, but there, there's also a choice to refuse them. And the duty is to meet needs, not only by way of direct payments. And I'm pretty sure, here we go, very first question, do I have to accept direct payment? No. Direct payments are a right, absent exceptional circumstances, but they're also a choice. A choice. And so any family who wants um, a service to meet the eligible needs of their child is entitled to a service instead. And I've given the quote from the um, direct payments guidance, a person does not have to accept direct payments. If they wish, they can choose instead to receive services that are provided or arranged by the council. The only problem, of course, as, as I also know here, is that um, if you're saying I want a service, then it falls back on the local authority to decide what service they're going to offer, and they will no doubt choose the cheapest. And then the question is, is that service um, actually going to meet the needs? Because if it is, then the chances are they're going to be um, entitled to say that's what we're prepared to fund. So the, one of the main reasons we have a scheme around direct payments is that um, they promote choice and control. You, if you've got the money, you've got much more um, control over what it's spent on than otherwise. So very important that families um, genuinely have a choice and some will want direct payments and some will want a service, but what isn't acceptable is that either option should be limited and, and, and taken off the table. And if you're interested in direct payments, I answer a lot more of the, the common questions, including a very important one of how much money should you get um, on, on the blog post. So that's uh, a very important point in relation to the CSDPA duty, essentially, because one, one way in which that duty can be discharged now is by making a direct payment. Uh, I'm asked a question by uh, Lisa um, from Hertfordshire about uh, the social services provision um, when based on single service provision, i.e. not a combined EHC plan, have to pay any regard to the child and young person's outcomes as we're coming to know them in areas of integrated provision. That's a very interesting question, Lisa. Um, no, in short, the, the outcomes duty is, relate, is related to the plan. And so one of the powers, um, one of the powerful aspects of having an EHC plan is that, of course, there will be specified outcomes that are intended to be achieved. But say the child is, is accessing um, some short breaks by reason of an assessment under the Children Act 1989. The Working Together guidance, let's have a quick look at that, um, talks very much about the need for a plan of action. So if we look at Working Together 2013, Bring the guidance up. If we do a quick search for plan, in the section, the heading that I'm looking for, focusing on outcomes. So the answer to your question, Lisa, is no, not in relation to any plan outcomes, but yes, very much. Any social care service that's provided should be focused on outcomes. As the guidance says, every assessment should be focused on outcomes. And where the outcome of the assessment is continued, children's services involvement, i.e. the provision of services, the social worker and their manager should agree a plan of action with other professionals and discuss this with the child and their family. Here's the important bit. The plan should set out what services are to be delivered and what actions to be undertaken and by whom and for what purpose. Who is going to do what, where and when to help the child. And the courts have said that that's a requirement for a realistic plan of action. That's the phrase that's always used. Um, the plan should reflect this, the fact that services can be provided for parents and carers as well and set clear measurable outcomes for the child and expectations for the parents. That language I think is very unhelpful because it certainly um, tends to suggest that these plans are all about risk 
And there is a real issue with working together 2013, which is that it brings together guidance on children in need and guidance on children at risk. So I would um, discount that expectations from the parents section when we're talking about disabled children, um, but very much focus on clear measurable outcomes for the child with measurable reviewable actions. The plan should be reviewed regularly to analyze whether significant progress has been made to meet the child's needs, brackets, and on the level of right risk faced by the child, often not relevant for us. Nor is the next section on neglect cases and uh, the test on about improvements in adult behavior. But very importantly, um, the review point should be agreed by the social worker with other professionals and with child and family to continue evaluating the impact of any change in the welfare of the child. So there's an ongoing duty to review services and whether outcomes are being met. So um, I would say this is a brilliant illustration of how the Children and Families Act is not the only game in town. Because very few children, relatively speaking, will have an EHC plan. Many more should be able to get a Children Act assessment and be accepted to be eligible for social care services. And then this is the relevant section of the guidance that, that requires there to be a, a plan of action uh, agreed with family, setting out what services should be delivered, by whom, for what purpose. So I hope that answers the question. Lisa, if it doesn't, feel free to type it back in the box and I'll have another go uh, after we have our break. I think all the other questions I've seen are about um, more about the, the, the next question about how we actually challenge uh, cuts. I'll just pick up Karen's question about holidays. Karen asks, can you ask how single parents are expected to have a holiday with their disabled child if the cuts go ahead, as you won't be able to offer financial support to anyone we need to take for help with the children? Well, firstly, there's a duty under the CSDPA to fund holidays, uh, which is separate from the short breaks duty. So if we again go to the blog, no, I think we might need it, but I'll take the direct payments one. Rights in reality holidays. You can see I've written a post that's specifically on disabled children's rights to a holiday where necessary. So it's it's one of the particular paragraphs of section two of the CSDPA that says the local authority must uh, facilitate the taking of holidays by the child or the disabled adult. And that could include funding the um, basic costs of the holiday if the family can't afford um, to pay the basic costs, not just the additional disability-related costs. So that's one important point, Karen. Um, short breaks themselves are really intended to be something that the child does separately from the parent. So I don't think any of the short breaks duties are particularly going to be relevant to questions of, of families having breaks together. That's much more where the CSDPA duty on holidays um, could be powerful. Okay, so talking of short breaks, um, let's take five minutes and we'll come back at five past two to carry on the webinar. Okay, everyone, hope you enjoyed your short break. I've got some excellent questions that I'm going to deal with for the first five minutes and then <clears throat> carry on with the, the presentation. So, before we get on to the law on challenging cuts, uh, first question from Carol. The Children and Families Act stipulates that local authorities have a duty to identify gaps in services linked to a local offer but no duty to provide. What is the point of that? Fair question, Carol. Um, the, the point really is everything that I've been talking about today. The duty you're talking about is section 27, subsection 2, which was, which was obviously on the slides that we've been discussing. Um, once a local authority has identified a gap in a service, it has to take a rational decision about whether or not that gap should be filled. So if it hasn't got a sufficient supply of short breaks, for example, under the regulations or, or other services under section 27, and it has to rationally consider what it's going to do about that. And um, a failure to take action could be challenged by way of judicial review. So, and of course, also, there is a duty to provide. It's in Section 2 of the, of the CSDPA. So it's a, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, I agree it would be helpful if Section 27 said, and they shall also provide the services. But we can construct that duty by other ways. So um, if, if you're told, oh, we don't have a duty to provide services, I would strongly be saying that's a point where legal advice might be required. Um, next one is from Teresa. Is the register mentioned the one that in some boroughs was held by the Family Information Service? It started out only holding severely disabled children's details and then opened a few years ago to all disabilities. And wasn't it optional so parents could choose not to go on the register? Which means the figure is not representative of the total number of disabled children in the borough. Um, the answer to most of those questions, I think, Teresa, is yes. But let me show you the duty. So if we go to Children Act 
1989. The Association of Health UK. This hasn't changed since 1989. Um, much of the Children Act has, but this duty is still the same. Um, we've got Section 17 itself at the start of Part 3, uh, provision of services for children in need. And then we've got the, the schedule all the way towards the back of the, of the Act. Um, schedule 2. See here, local authority support for children and families. Expand that, um, and then we go down to paragraph two of that schedule: maintenance of a register of disabled children. <clears throat> Here's the duty: every local authority shall open and maintain a register of disabled children within their area. And you can tell it was 1989 because it says that register may be kept by means of a computer. It would be pretty astonishing if uh, in 2015 it was kept any other way. So. Um, it may be that initially the register was limited to, fam to severely disabled children. If it was, that was unlawful because it's very clear the duty is to maintain a register of disabled children, which has the same meaning as in Section 17 itself, i.e. that very broad, if rather medical, meaning. Is it optional? Yes, it is. Um, you can't force a family to go on the register. But what it would mean if the local authority was operating a, a lawful register system is that at least all families who want their details to be known and who want services can get on the register and then the forum can encourage families to go on on the basis that that register then becomes the resource that allows the local authority to comply with its sufficiency duties and families can say well you know, we want our, our needs to be recognised and that's the mechanism and it's a legal duty to have one so um, there is an important principle there and I think it's useful as well because without a, a register even though it is limited because it's voluntary uh, it's very hard to see how a local authority can properly understand what the level of need will be um, other measures are all going to be proxy measures and they're not going to be good enough in my view. Um, Laurie asked a couple of questions. Uh, firstly, about signposting families to universal services as the first point of call, even where it's clearly not going to be appropriate. Uh, this is an interesting one because it's fine for families to be signposted to universal services. In fact, it's obviously correct and, and, and a failure to help families access universal services would be, could be a breach of the Equality Act. But the key thing is that any disabled child um, who appears to be have additional needs, and certainly where, one, uh, where any, any family requests one, is entitled to an assessment. So there has to be a, a two-tier approach at the same time as saying that these are the universal services that are available to all children, and we would strongly suggest that you try and access them. The local authority would have to say, and we will carry out our social work assessment under the Children Act, applying the, the Working Together guidance. So if there's a policy, and, and policies don't have to be written down, of course, it can be, they can be evidenced by a number of cases. Um, if there's a policy that says we essentially don't do assessments because we want children to access universal services, that will be unlawful. And the second question, Laurie, is um, the local authority, when challenges have been made around short breaks, responded they'd only consider the process and not the decision. The onus is then placed on the person challenging to identify whether the process has been wrong. Surely this isn't fair. Well, it's interesting because the ultimate legal challenge, of course, is judicial review. And judicial review is usually about the process. It's very rare that the court will get into the substance of the decision. And certainly the court isn't going to say, well, it should be six hours breaks instead of four or anything like that. Uh, and it is, I think, um, usually correct that if someone's saying a process is wrong, they should explain why it's wrong. Uh, but ultimately, of course, the, the, the remedy is the High Court, and any, if, if things have gone wrong, then that's where families can go. Um, so the, if the local authority is, is, is never agreeing to review the substance of this decision, that may itself be an unfair process. So it's certainly something that I would say families should take advice on if that's affecting them. It does feel, from what you said, Laurie, rather like a blanket policy, and as, as I'm sure people are, are aware, blanket policies are, tend to be unlawful because the law normally expects, at the very least, there to be an exceptional case provision. And uh, a question, I don't know who this is from, so apologies, but the question is, uh, what if short breaks assessments say there are no eligibility criteria and there's only a case-by-case -case assessment? How can you demonstrate that thresholds appear to be raised or people are being refused support on the basis of conditions? For example, I've heard this before, high-functioning autism, secret criteria. Well, two things on that. Um, Short break services statement has to include eligibility criteria. So if, if, if the local authority is not indeed using eligibility 
criteria, it must say so in its short break services statement. My understanding is every local authority has eligibility criteria, so I'd be very surprised if any local authority would say publicly we do not use them. Um, there's no requirement to have eligibility criteria, and in fact when Lord Laming reviewed uh, children's services law in uh, response to the Victoria Columbia tragedy, he said that they shouldn't be used and that the local authorities should do exactly what's said here. They should always just assess on a case-by-case -case basis. So there's nothing legally wrong with not having criteria. I'd be very surprised if it actually happens. What you would need to do then is assess each child and decide is it necessary to meet this child's needs. And as long as that's done rationally and fairly, then uh, there's nothing unlawful about that. Uh, there's a question from Jeremy as well, but I'll answer that a bit later, Jeremy, if I may, because it's about um, the issues we're about to come on to, which is challenging cuts, as are questions from Sharon, Andrea and Chris that were asked uh, in advance, which I haven't forgotten, I promise. So, um, we've got about 45 minutes left. I'm going to move back to the slides now and uh, talk about, in particular, uh, first of all, two areas, consultation and the public sector equality duty. And you can pick this up on the paper if you're following it. I'm afraid there aren't page numbers on the paper, which is very unfortunate. Um, but after the numbered sections dealing with the key legal issues, we then have a couple of questions, or in fact, a number of questions we suggest should be asked. Um, and the first is about consultation. Now, consultation is a very live issue at the moment, uh, particularly because of the Supreme Court's recent judgment in the case of Mosley. And now there's a number of cases uh, underway where the High Court and the Court of Appeal is being asked to work out what Mosley means for uh, other cases. And what we think, the lawyers that tend to act for families and uh, disabled people think, is that Mosley uh, is about all consultations, not just limited to the facts of, of that case or consultations that are like it, um, which is about, in that case, um, the council tax reduction scheme and support for poorest council taxpayers. So we say, we say what the Supreme Court said in Mosley applies generally, and what they were saying was that where you're consulting on a proposal, you're, you, you may be obliged, um, if it would be unfair not to, to tell people about arguable but discarded alternatives. And we would say that includes things like using reserves, increasing council tax, and so on. And across the board, that's not what happens. So when we see local authorities putting forward proposals for cuts to disabled children's services or adult services, What's usually taught, said is uh, we need to cut three million pounds from our budget. Uh, what isn't um, said is, um, or alternatively, if we use some of our reserves, we can only cut one million pounds. What do you think about that? And the question really in the next round of, of cases is going to be, um, is it lawful not to provide that information? But whether or not it's strictly required as a matter of law, I would strongly be saying to forums, ask that question in response to consultations. What else could you do? Are there other options? Um, have you thought about the ways you can make efficiency savings? Do you have to cut frontline services or, or funding that's available for direct payments and so on? So that's really the big battleground at the moment. Um, what is required by way of a fair consultation um, in relation to other options on um, when, when cuts are being put forward? And the reason why this um, is all potentially required is the common law. Now, what, what's the common law? It's the standards of our civilized society that essentially the judges have come up with over time, and therefore it is changing. As time moves on and as society progresses, the standards of the common law can move. Uh, but the essential principle is fairness. And one of the things we know from a, a very important court of appeal case called Ex parte Cochrane is that if even if the local authority or the public body didn't have to consult, once they choose to consult, they have to do it properly. And proper consultation is fair consultation. So you might be told, oh, well, we didn't need to consult, so it's up to us what we do. And that's simply not right. If they choose to consult, then they have to do so properly and fairly. And the four things that particularly seem to matter are, firstly, do you, did they give enough time to consult? To, for consultees to respond properly. Did consultees have sufficient information? That's often where the legal challenge comes. Um, did all the relevant people have fair access to the consultation? I think that's really important on, on these issues. You know, have disabled children and young people been asked in ways that are accessible to them um, what they think about proposals to reduce services and what other options might be available? And then were, were any alternatives covered? That's, as I say, the big issue at the moment. Uh, I did have a particular question about consultation uh, from Sharon, uh, asking about a particular local authority who, uh, Sharon, I won't name, 
Um, but the question really was about a process uh, issue, about consulting over Christmas with short deadline uh, and no face-to-face -face consultation. And that really does go into the kind of issues of fairness that, that the law is very concerned with. Uh, and, and each case will be judged on its particular facts. So how long, how many, um, how much effort was made to bring the consultation to the attention of relevant pet families? Um, precisely how long did it run for? When it was extended, did people get told? Um, no, if there was no face-to-face -face consultation, does that make it unfair? I would say those are exactly the kind of questions to take legal advice on if, uh, if you're really unhappy with the consultation um, uh, pr process. We'll come on to taking legal advice and what that means shortly, but it's certainly the issues that you raise, Sharon, are the kinds of things that I'm often asked to advise on in particular cases. And then uh, Chris uh, asked about specimen letters that can be sent to local authorities suggesting the consultation has been flawed. Well, there are specimen letters in the um, PACRIS for um, Every Disabled Child Matters, which can certainly be adapted um, just, just to make that single point. They make a whole load of points, but you could just take out most of the content and make that particular point. Uh, but it really is quite simple, I think. You, you say here for your local authority, the problem is about not framing the issues in the way that young people with learning disabilities can understand. And that, I would say, is, is required um, by Section 19 of the Children and Families Act, which is all about participation for children and, and parents. So Section 19 of the Children and Families Act. Um, the Equality Act uh, and the uh, Reasonable Adjustments Duty and uh, the Public Sector Equality Duty as well. And also um, possibly human rights considerations in terms of Article 14, that the children and young people are being discriminated against by not being given... Um, fair access to the consultation. So those are the kinds of um, legal issues that I'd be looking at uh, arguing where you've got a situation where it's only parents that are consulted and um, children and young people themselves are, are not being given uh, the opportunity to have their say. And then, uh, sorry, the question just come in hot off the press. Um, from Jules is, is asking a very interesting question about um, why I said earlier that more children should expect support via social care than get an education, health and care plan and, and saying that I think figures will probably be from her local authority um, that many more children have got a plan or a statement than are getting social care and I would say that that's pretty concerning because if you think about the, um, where the relevant threshold is like, the threshold for the EHC uh, plan statements is, is pretty high in terms of uh, need to demonstrate significant special educational needs essentially that are not being met. It's a very summary approach. Whereas for social care, certainly in terms of assessment, um, the duty to assess is for all disabled children. There may well then be criteria that limit that take out some for eligibility for the services. Um, and there's the, the, the non-assessed band of provision, uh, we hope, in, in at least most areas still from, from aiming high for disabled children. Uh, and so the question Jules asks is, is that evidence that needs aren't being met? And I would say quite possibly. And that's certainly something that I would be wanting to press um, the local authority on. How can there be uh, three times, for example, the number of children with statements uh, than, than are accessing social care? OK, so um, that's consultation. Then got public sector quality duty, which I've already uh, touched on in, in some detail. Um, and as I mentioned previously, bracking really, I think, is the key case now. And if you're going to look at a case, then it's, uh, it's a really good one to look at. And just again, to remind people who've not been on this journey with me before, how do you find cases? The answer is you Google the title, of course. And bracking is bracking, Secretary of State, Work and Pensions. And I'm hoping, well, in fact, let's cheat. Let's put Bailey in as well. So B-A-I-L-L. I should do it. There it is. Uh, that's the one, hopefully. It's B A I L W -I, I. I always get that wrong. Yeah, brilliant. So this is the Court of Appeal judgment. Very important that you make sure if you're looking at this that you find the Court of Appeal judgment, not the judgment of the High Court, which is Mr. Justice Blake. And um, I won't, for time reasons, go through the detail now. What I will show you though is two things. Firstly, um, once we go past the background facts, there's a summary of the law, both on consultation and on the public sector equality duty, which is absolutely great. So that's all the law that you need. And also, what was this case about? It was about the decision to close the independent living fund. As you can see, the minister decided to close the fund known as the independent living fund. 
Now, this is the first round of challenge to that decision, and this case succeeded in the Court of Appeal. Uh, the, minister, the, the new minister remade the decision, and the second round of judicial review challenge failed. And that's what I would say is quite a rare example, really, of judicial review uh, not achieving a long-term benefit. It certainly achieved some benefit because it kept the fund open for quite some time more, but in the end, it is, uh, unless politically that's reversed, it is going to be closed. People will be aware the Independent Living Fund is a, is a fund that was set up to support independent living for disabled adults, um, but it's been closed to new applications for some time, so it's already of, of limited value to, to disabled children. So it's a disappointing outcome, but this judgment is a very important um, statement of principle in relation to the public sector equality duty. And if you read it all, I hope you will agree that there are two key questions that really come out of uh, the judgment in Brecking. And the first question is, does the decision maker understand the impact of the proposal? And what you might find astonishing is that in Bracking, the Court of Appeal held that the Minister for Disabled People didn't understand what would happen to disabled people affected by the closure of the Independent Living Fund. Uh, that, I think, is very surprising, but it may be rather easier to show that local authorities who are dealing with a much wider range of issues don't really understand impact of proposed cuts um, at the time they're made. And if they don't, then that will be a breach of the public sector equality duty. And then even if they can show that they've understood the impact of what's proposed, which may well involve consultation, of course, so there's an obvious link, um, have they then specifically considered the statutory needs, in, for example, the need to advance equality of opportunity for disabled people, not just generally thought about, is this a good idea, or how will it affect disabled people, but actually looked at those needs that are identified in the Act, including the need to advance equality of opportunity, and thought about whether the decision is consistent with that need, and if it's not, whether there's anything else they can do. Now, as the slide says, don't get too hung up on the equality impact assessment, because there's no duty to do an EIA. The duty is to have regard to the needs, and a way that many local authorities choose to show they have had regard is by carrying out an EIA. Uh, but that's optional. What's mandatory is the due regard, which needs to be evidenced in some way. So the question to the local authority isn't, in my view, where's your EIA? The question is, how can you show us that when you reach the decision? Um, the councillors, who of course are the decision makers here, properly understood the impact and specifically considered the statutory needs. And then the third issue I wanted to flag on, on um, challenging cuts is, is to look out for the legal errors, the common legal errors that seem to creep in because these would render any cuts potentially unlawful. First is something I've already discussed, which was the um, issue around access to assessments being restricted to certain groups of disabled children, for example, those with complex needs. And one of the points I make about that is, is even though, you know, obviously we can just say, well, look, the guidance says don't do it. And guidance, this sorts of guidance, statutory guidance, has to be followed unless there's a good reason not to do so. But even if the guidance didn't say you must do an assessment, a social work assessment for all children, in need, surely it's irrational to decide before you've assessed whether the needs of a particular child are complex. The point of the assessment is to assess the level and nature of the needs. So it puts the cart before the horse to have a policy where access to assessment is restricted. What, what local authorities are allowed to do is restrict access to services once they've done the assessment if they rationally conclude that the child's needs uh, are not such that it's necessary to meet them. That's the eligibility criteria point. So it's very important that assessment, the assessment duty is, is discharged properly so that local authorities can take an informed decision about whether the child has got complex needs in the family, in the family context because children's needs don't exist in a vacuum. And that's what the guidance makes clear. Then we've got the very interesting legal question about uh, specific service reductions uh, and closures. There's been a recent judgment of the Court of Appeal um, in a case about um, transport services for disabled adults called Robson. Um, Salford, if I remember rightly, is the local authority. And um, what the Court of Appeal said there, amongst other things, was that the claimants couldn't show that there were no other alternative services that were available to meet the needs. But if they could have shown that, then the decision to close the transport service uh, would have been unlawful. And so that's the question to ask. If, if, if the cut to funding will result in a specific service reducing its, its provision or closing, then can the local authority demonstrate that there are other alternatives that are going to meet the needs of those people who are accessing the service? 
And I suppose there, there, there's three possible answers um, from a local authority to that question. One is, yes, we can. And then you need to consider the answer and see whether you accept it. Uh, the next question, the next answer might be, uh, no, we can't, so we won't do it. Great. And then the third answer is, no, we can't, but it doesn't matter because we didn't have a duty to provide the services anyway. And that's where it gets very interesting because then you have to look at each of the assessments of people who are using that service and uh, see if the assessment shows that they've got needs that have to be met, eligible needs. And that would have to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. But it's another reason why, um, in my view, it ne there needs to be an, a guarantee of service provision through an assessment, certainly for um, families with, where children have significant needs. Because if, you've got, if you're accessing short breaks on a non-assessed basis, the problem with that is that the breaks can be taken away. And it's very hard then to challenge that because you've got no baseline from the assessment to show that, the, um, that there were eligible needs that felt to, be, felt to be met. So that is one caveat I would give to the, the general support for non-assessed breaks, is it does leave uh, families vulnerable to having the breaks removed and not being able to say, well, this, this break is meeting an assessed need. So that's point two. Um, and then point three is about eligibility criteria. And as, if newer criteria are proposed, there's really two issues there. Uh, the first is, um, are the criteria lawful? And, and really there you're looking at JL and Islington and thinking about things like um, do, do they allow for every uh, charge to have an assessment? Do they, allow, do they um, require services to be provided to meet needs where it's necessary to do so? Is there no cap on the amount of service that can be provided? Those are the sorts of questions about lawfulness. And then have they avoided, has the local authority avoided the JL and Islington error, the primary error, which is to use the criteria as the way of reducing services without doing a reassessment. And um, the recent European Court of Human Rights judgment, McDonald and uh, the United Kingdom, makes clear that if you reduce services without carrying out a reassessment and complying with your assessment duties, then that can well be a breach of um, Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So it could well be a, a, a human rights violation, not simply a, a, a breach of the statutory guidance. So those are the three areas of law we wanted to uh, flag as particularly relevant to, to challenges to uh, proposals to cut breaks. Um, looking again at the questions, um, two from Jeremy here. Um, if, if some of the arguments and challenges in short rate cuts have been used by the local, again, with the local authority and they failed to respond, what, what can you do? Well, that may well be, Jeremy, a situation where you need to think about escalating it to getting legal advice because one of the key principles we'll come on to is that um, the law needs to be used as a last resort, but equally you can't hang about because decisions need to be challenged by way of judicial review promptly. So my general message is always consider getting specialist advice early, but don't expect that the answer is necessarily going to be go straight to court. The, um, the court will expect um, families, local groups, to have worked with the local authority as far as possible to see if um, things can be resolved and, and avoided. And that's clearly better for everyone. It's better for the family, it's better for public expenditure and so on. But where you've got a situation like you described, where challenges have been made and, and either there's been no response or an, an, an inadequate response, that's where uh, it may be useful to get advice. And um, another question from Jeremy is about where a business case has been made for short breaks cut. Um, and uh, that, oh, I've heard this before, there was there's a suggestion of um, parent forum support or at least participation in that process and that's not accurate. You know, does that invalidate the document? Well, I think it, this is something that really concerns me because co-production is so fundamental to the Children and Families Act schemes. You know, they're expressed in the Code of Practice as a, as a vital principle. Section 19, uh, the statutory duty, underpins it. And yeah, I'm hearing too many cases now where um, parent forums are being um, identified as, as in some way part responsible for cuts and proposals, proposed cuts where that's not the case, where either they don't know about the proposal or they've never supported it and so on. And I think that's really concerning and I would say that should be taken up with the most senior people you can within the local authority. I'd be suggesting speaking to contact family about it, speaking to the department. Um, and if none of that works, then legal advice may be needed. But I would imagine that um, those other routes would well be, could well be able to deal with that problem because uh, it will undermine the entire 
um, reform program if um, local authorities are not properly respecting principles of co-production and are trying to um, sh get, look, get forums to shoulder the blame for what's going on in terms of cuts. Um, as a legal matter, would it make the whole business case invalid? It would all depend. Sorry, Jeremy, the usual lawyer's answer. It would depend on how bad the inaccuracies are. So I can't give a, a, a straight answer to that one, I'm afraid. Oh, lots more questions just arriving. Thanks, Drew. So I'll deal with those in a moment. But um, we'll move on now to uh, the final section of the talk, which is about um, ways to challenge. Um, first task, of course, is, is make sure you see the cuts coming. Now, it's very important to bear in mind where we are in the process. We're, we're talking on Friday, the 23rd of January. Um, most local authorities are setting their budgets in mid-February. Some, I know, some on the 13th, some on the 19th, and so on. So we're getting very close now to the time when the final decision is being taken. But there is still time to influence. It's one of the reasons why we were very keen to have the seminar, uh, the webinar today, uh, because you've got two, three, four weeks perhaps left to um, try and persuade local authorities, as has happened in Hampshire, that um, short breaks shouldn't be cut. So first of all, make sure you see the cuts coming. Um, all local authorities, pub, as far as I know, publish, um, and India, I believe that they're, they're required to publish um, papers in advance on their website. So someone is going to have to have the job, at least one person, going on the website and considering the agendas for the upcoming meetings of the cabinet, which is the executive, and the council, which is the, effectively the parliament for the local authority, and seeing what's on there that might be relevant to disabled children generally and, and to short breaks in particular, and going through um, those proposals and understanding what's, um, what's going on. Now, hopefully, um, you won't need to do that because the local authority has been open and transparent with you in the spirit of co-production. But if that hasn't happened, then, then it's up to the forum and to, to families to, uh, to take the initiative and to try and do that. Um, does anyone in the forum have finance experience? At the end of the day, a lot of these papers are very inaccessible. But if you've got anyone in the forum who's a qualified accountant or otherwise um, good with numbers, then get them on the case trying to understand what exactly is proposed and see if there's any uh, any areas where there isn't enough clarity or where concerns can be raised. Um, in any event, ask the councillors and the officers to explain the proposals. That's what co-production means, isn't it? Uh, speak to your contacts within the local authority. I, I, I always say try and go as high up the chain as you can, um, director of children's services, head of service and so on. Um, and certainly speak to the councillors as well because they are the elected representatives and it's their job to understand the, the concerns of their constituents and to, and to respond to them. So make sure the lead member for children's services is, is fully aware about what's being proposed in terms of cuts and, and is able to explain um, how they're still going to be able to comply with all their duties. And do it all as early as possible, yeah, which is not very helpful of me to say, but, but certainly necessary that this all really does need to be done now. As we say on the next slide, don't hang about. Um, if any consultation took place, it will now almost certainly have concluded or, or be very close to concluding. Uh, and so. If possible, proposed cuts need to be challenged before they're made because it's just going to be so much more straightforward. Um, that's, a, that's a legal position, but it's also a, a campaigning position. Uh, let's, let's see if we can persuade the local authorities uh, to not cut short break services um, using all the arguments we've set out today, uh, the legal arguments, but also the fact that funding in this area really apparently has been maintained as opposed to other areas um, before the, the budgets are set. So once the budget is set, actually challenging that budget is going to be difficult. But a budget is simply an estimate of expenditure. So it's still going to be possible to challenge how the cuts implemented if there's no, no or no proper consultation, no proper uh, consideration of the public sector equality duty, or if what's going to happen in the local authority after the cut is not going to comply with the statutory duties that we've, we've been outlining today then uh, challenges can still be made, again, political, campaigning, lobbying type challenges, but also ultimately legal challenges. So legal challenges, um, what's the route? Well, it is uh, unsurprisingly judicial review. And if we go back to the paper, uh, and you jump forward uh, a little in the, in the paper, um, you've got the template letters that I described uh, earlier on, mentioned in relation to one of the questions. Um, which I won't spend any time on now, you can read uh, in, in your own time. And then after that, you've got a section headed further support and legal advice. Um, as you say in the paper, we hope that um, this won't be necessary, but if local campaign doesn't uh, reduce the cuts, then um, families and local groups can consider advice on judicial review. 
Um, judicial review sounds terrifying, remote, very difficult. I always say that if I was a family of the disabled child, a parent of a disabled child, considering legal action, I would hope that it would be judicial review rather than the tribunal, because in the tribunal you're often on your own, and uh, the process is extremely involved. Whereas in judicial review, you will have lawyers representing you because you can't really do it otherwise, and um, the role of the family is very often just to provide written evidence and, and to instruct the lawyers who then get on with it. So it's actually, a, in a way, a less daunting and onerous process than having to go to the tribunal. Um, the, the limits to judicial, to judicial review, of course, as the name suggests, are that it's a review function. So the tribunal stands in the shoes of the local authority and decides for itself what needs to go in the child's EHC plan, for example. The High Court doesn't do that uh, in judicial review. What it's doing is reviewing essentially whether the process was put for uh, and when, when, whether the outcome uh, complies with statutory duties. So we're looking at quite things like rationality, have all the relevant factors been taken into account? Has the process been fair? That's where the consultation duties come from, the requirements for procedural fairness, and has, has the law been followed? Um, there's a very important principle that judicial review needs to be brought promptly. People often say, oh, the time limit is three months. The time limit is promptly and no later than three months. So don't be fooled into thinking you've got three months from a decision to challenge it. Uh, in fact, if it's a budget decision, you need to challenge it very, very quickly indeed. So again, the principle is get advice early, um, but don't take steps until you've had advice. Um, a letter before action will need to be sent by your solicitors. Um, the usual response time will be 14 days, but it can be shorter in the appropriate case. Uh, and legal aid is still um, generally available. Very important, and I'll come on to Andrea's question in a moment, um, that in most cases, the child will be the proper claimant, and therefore the assessment of means for the purpose of legal aid will be um, based on the child's finances. And um, there may be an issue here that the defendant might argue that actually the proper claim is the parents, not the child. So it may be that if there's a, a, a policy challenge or a cuts challenge, uh, the, the appropriate claimants there are going to be families who are, where the parents are themselves legally aidable. Um, and that might be an answer to, uh, to Andrew's question, which is, uh, am I able to include advice or direction on a common problem? Uh, parent carers who do not qualify for legal aid due to household income but can't afford to pay for a solicitor. Well, that is a real problem, Andrea, because um, you can't sensibly go to the High Court without legal aid because either um, you won't be able to afford your own lawyers, um, but even if you can find lawyers who are willing to act pro bono as, as we, we do and, uh, and or on low fees, the real problem is what about the other side's legal costs? Uh, now, in, in theory, you can find ways around that, but it's a real practical problem that families um, can't risk incurring the costs of the local authority or, or the other public body. Um, because legal aid comes with cost protection. So if, if legal aid is in place, then uh, in, in practice, there is no real risk of having to pay the other side's costs. So what do you do? Well, we make sure that the claimants in a policy challenge are people who are legally able. So that's why forums need to work with um, families and, and challenges need to be brought by people who are in a position to bring them. So uh, my, my basic message there is the parents need to, to work together. Um, if you've got an, an individual case where really it is just one family affected, um, then letters can be sent, lobbying can be done, but at the end of the day, going to court without legal aid is going to be very difficult, if not impossible, I'm afraid to say. Um, and the likely outcome in any judicial review case is, of course, that the decision is going to be quashed um, and then may be taken again. And as in the independent living fund case, it's possible that the same decision gets taken. Um, but equally, it's possible and in fact more likely that the same decision won't get taken. And the example I often trot out is what happened in Birmingham when they proposed to move their adult social care funding to um, critical only, the uh, highest level of, of provision. And um, we stopped that through a judicial review challenge, which was based on the public sector equality duty and also on consultation. Both process challenges, of course, but Birmingham have never sought to take that decision again um, over the last few years. There was a change in, in the political administration, which of course may have had an impact, but for whatever reason, um, adults, disabled adults with substantial needs in Birmingham are still having those needs met, and that's what judicial review typically does. It, it, it's a process challenge, but it leads to substantive outcomes, not just, um, not just a new decision. So those were um, very headline thoughts on um, 
ways to challenge. I've got a number of more questions that I'm going to answer in the time um, that we've got available. Just to flag some resources, there's the link for the EDCM resource. In terms of short breaks um, and, and challenging the cuts, people may well have seen those posts. And then there's also the post on, on judicial review, which I would say is a very helpful primer, I would say I wrote it, um, for families who might be thinking about a judicial review challenge and trying to understand what's involved, because why would you know as a family um, what, what judicial review is until you suddenly are told that it's the way in which you can try and remedy uh, problems that you're facing. Right, so I'll move on now to, to the next um, and what might be the final set of questions, unless uh, Ruth or Helen appear with, with, with any more. Um, I'm asked by Carol, at some point local authorities will run out of reserves, what then? Uh, all the protest to central government about the cuts is coming from parent care services so and so on and not from professionals. Um, is there no campaign to enable them to protest and put a case to central government? Well, it's a very powerful point, Carol. I mean, it's, it's beyond my uh, remit, really, for today. Um, but I think what I can say is that um, I agree that local authorities, and, and we haven't really talked about health today, but, but to, uh, the local NHS needs to be stressing to central government what the impact of the cuts is. And in many areas, it's happening. Those of you on social media will see. Um, that people are putting forward deputations, for example, Newcastle were, were uh, been stressing very publicly what the scale of the cuts is going to be um, as a result of the reductions in central government funding there. Um, and these are ultimately political rather than legal questions. Um, but yes, in a way, local authorities and, and the local NHS can't have it both ways. Um, their job is to comply with their duties and, and provide services to, to groups, including our families, and if they haven't got enough money to meet their duties, then they have to take that up with the centre, um, and the, the duties fall to be met. So, as I say, it's a political question, but the legal um, answer is that um, some of the duties are not dependent on resources and have to be met, even if the reserves run out. Um, another uh, question from Carol around um, increasing numbers of ch children who have autism and a PDA, whose parents have requested assessments, but the assessment hasn't been affected um, due to a lack of knowledge about the condition by the social worker. And, and that's a common theme that I've had um, throughout my, my career about the, the, the poor quality of assessment. Uh, and in terms of remedies here, well, of course, you can ask and should ask for assessments to be done by people who, who understand the, the condition and the needs the child's likely to have. Um, the court is only going to interfere if the assessment is, is obviously flawed, and, and some of them will be. Um, if there's a, a, an overall uh, problem, a systemic problem about lack of expertise, then um, that's something that can be taken up by the forum with the, with the local authority. And again, if not resolved, legal advice can be sought. Uh, of course, the Autism Act statutory guidance talks specifically about training requirements for assessments of adults with autism, but we don't have the same for children, which is, a, which is an obvious gap. So um, there is a legal remedy there, and, and I have challenged assessments um, on the basis that the, assess the assessor didn't have sufficient expertise and understanding of the condition, but it's going to be difficult because the court is not going to want to second guess professionals unless the, uh, the answer is really obvious. Um, Laura's question is that local authorities contacting parents to say that they need to pay back expenses and travel paid via direct payments to staff, um, no longer allow expenses, only wages for direct payments and parents being told they're not in touch with new assessments to accommodate uh, this, and that, that this is having a direct impact on children. Well, this, that's exactly, I think, Laurie, what I was saying in terms of the common questions point. What, you know, what are we, what, what's going to happen? How are the local authorities going to deliver the cuts? How are they going to put the cuts into effect? And it may well be that the policies that are put in place are unlawful. And again, I'm going to go back to the, um, the direct payment blog post, because it's very clear um, in the guidance, at least, that direct payments have to meet the reasonable cost of providing the necessary service. That's the statutory test, and that will include all the associated costs, including expenses and so on. So it isn't going to be lawful for a local authority to say that our direct payments will only meet wages. They have to, the direct payment has to be sufficient to meet national insurance and, and other and tax and other on costs. Um, otherwise, they're not complying with their duty, which is to meet the needs. And I'm pretty sure, again, that's going to be one of the specific questions uh, that we addressed. There we go. Does the direct payment have to be enough to cover things like transport and activity costs? Generally, yes. 
So, for example, if the need is about um, access to the community, addressing social isolation and so on, uh, and part of that involves going to a place which, where there's a, a small charge, then that is part of the necessary cost, unless the local authority can show that the need can be met at a lower cost. And that's really the point of assessing the, 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 the quantum of direct payments, the amount of direct payments, is the local authority is saying, this is what we say is the reasonable cost, all of the reasonable cost, of, of meeting the need. Uh, and then it's up to the family how that money is actually spent. That's choice and control. But the baseline duty is to make sure the direct payment is um, enough to meet the needs. And as we say there, as I say here, the only situation where a direct payment need not cover those costs is if a local authority can reasonably conclude that it's not necessary for it to provide those services because they can be met another way. And in terms of transport, there is a specific duty under the CSDPA to fund transport costs. If we find the, the section itself, something that is relevant for a lot of the discussion today, this is the services list in the CSDPA. These are the services that it may be necessary to provide. If you can um, find your way through all the wording here, just focus on the wording of the list. Practical assistance in the home, short breaks at home. Um, provision of, of recreational facilities, B. Um, provision of... Uh, lectures, games, outings, or other recreational facilities outside the home, short breaks in the community, um, and then travel at D, at D, sorry, the provision of uh, facilities for or assistance in traveling to and from home for the purpose of participating in these services under, and don't worry about the rest, essentially that means uh, travel for the purposes of accessing social care services. Adaptations at E, holidays at F, meals on wheels at G, and uh, uh, assistance in getting a telephone at H, which is probably not going to result in iPhones being provided. I don't think that's really um, perhaps been kept up to date. But you can see how broad Section 2 is and, and how broad the duties are. And the direct payment duty reflects this because the duty is to fund the reasonable cost of securing services that are necessary under the CSDPA. So it's quite a long answer, Laurie, I'm afraid, but the uh, I think it's an important general point about how um, direct payments can't be used as a mechanism to deliver cuts. The duty remains as it always has been to provide a direct payment that is sufficient to meet needs. Okay, I think I've answered all the questions and I'm coming to, I've come towards the end of the slides. I'm just going to uh, hold fire for a moment before we go to the end and see if uh, Ruth or Helen are going to come through with any final questions. So I'm waiting to see if I get any more. Um, I hope everyone knows already that's that's how you can contact me and uh, that's my Twitter handle for those uh, who are on Twitter and I would recommend it. It is a brilliant resource for finding out what's going on um, if you follow some of the key disabled children's organisations including of course Combat Family and the National Network of Forums uh, and, and often the individual forums have fantastic accounts as well. Um, please do feel free to email me. Uh, of course, if you email me and ask for advice, I'm really sorry, I'm not going to be able to answer. Um, I will probably just send you the link to the um, list of solicitors who are experts in this area and who can provide advice. Um, some of those are in the uh, paper from EDCM. There's a longer list on the blog. Uh, what about forums getting legal advice? Because that's a very important point. Uh, it will be difficult because forums aren't eligible for legal aid. Uh, legal aid is available for individuals. So the question is, does the forum um, get in touch with solicitors, help the families who may be eligible um, get to the right solicitor, those kind of things I'd suggest. Um, individual, if the forum wants advice as a forum, um, for example, the local authority is say that you've co-produced uh, a policy or a cut that you haven't and you want to take legal advice on that, you may well have to pay perhaps a fixed fee. Um, if you want to issue court proceedings as a forum, that will be very difficult as well. Uh, you might be able to get a protective costs order, but those are quite hard to come by, which would, which would limit the amount of costs that you have to pay if the claim failed. Um, the solicitors who are, who are listed here are well placed to advise on things like that. But the general rule is that the claims in this area are brought by families with the benefit of legal aid. So um, I would suggest the main role of the forum on in, in terms of challenges is going to be to help families get the right solicitors to help them. But the main role of the forum, uh, as a concluding thought, is of course to try and stop the cuts from happening in the first place by way of um, working in partnership with local authorities. Um, and, and most local authorities, in my view, do want to work in partnership and are working in partnership with, with the forums. Um, I tend to hear about the ones that aren't because of where I sit in the process. But um, the majority 
where the, where, the, where the majority of relationships are good, forums can continue to work with the authorities. What's important, I think, is where things do go wrong, that forums and families don't just feel there is no option, because that um, would completely undermine <coughs> the, this whole new scheme that we're supposed to have in place that is about achieving better outcomes for children and families. Okay, so the final question I'm going to answer um, before we, we uh, end the webinar. Um, in the light of the Children and Families Act and co-production good practice, should the local authorities have already contacted parent care forums about proposed cuts to shore breaks? And I can give a one-word answer to that question, which is yes. Uh, and then I'll give a slightly longer answer, which is uh, that's exactly what Section 19 of the Children and Families Act, in my view, is intended to achieve, that there is uh, proper partnership working between local authorities um, and families and forums. And so if it isn't possible to sustain the level of funding at the moment. Um, that's worked through properly with families in advance and, and the best possible um, decisions are taken that protects the interests of children and puts, put the, puts the children's interests first. Um, so that's really what we should be fighting for, fighting to make sure we achieve. Are the cuts really unavoidable? And if they are, um, how can they be mitigated and how can um, the money that, is, that it does remain available best be used to, to support our families? That's the outcome that um, I would say the Children and Families Act is pointing towards. So thanks for very much, as always, for all the excellent questions. Um, here's the final slide. You will hopefully get a short questionnaire at the end of the webinar, which we do really um, ask you to complete and um, fill in so that we know exactly what you'd like to hear more about and also to help us um, with funding and with planning for future events. And as it says at the end there, the recording and the presentation and questions will be on the resources page of the Contact Family website next week because of the fantastically efficient team who are responsible for doing it. And you'll get emailed about that once uh, once it's up. So thanks so much for everyone who's, um, who's taken part this afternoon. Uh, as always, thanks for the excellent questions. I hope it's useful. I hope most of all that you're um, successful in all the work you're doing to try and defend uh, funding and provision of short breaks. such a vital resource for our families. Uh, thanks everyone and uh, have a good rest of your day.